Um, this morning we, we continue our way in, in the book of Judges. Uh, we're going to be in Judges chapter 3, if you have your Bibles or app or whatever, if you want to go ahead and turn there. And just to remind us where we're at, um, the Israelites, they've, they're finally in the promised land, this place that, that, that they've been longing to go. They, they're, they're finally there. They, they, they finally arrived in the days of Joshua. There's the conquest of the land, but at the same time there's been the conquest of the land, the conquest hasn't been complete, Right. Um, there's still many others that live in those lands, and so Israel has many neighbors that can tempt them. And as Peter spoke about last week, um, one of the things, and if you're familiar at all with the book of Judges, you're familiar with this idea of the cycles, right? These, these, the cyclical nature of the book of Judges, where the, the people turn away from God, they turn away from Yahweh, and then he, he sends some sort of oppression to them. Then they uh, cry out to him, and then he comes in and he rescues them with a judge, right? And so this morning what we're going to see is the very first cycle of that cycle in the book of Judges in the, with the judge Othniel, okay? A judge that most of us were probably not that familiar with, uh, partially because it's very plain and vanilla what we learn about him. Uh, Othniel is kind of, as we're going to see this morning, he's kind of like the prototypical judge. Everything goes perfect, okay? And as we move along in the book of Judges, we're going to see more and more and more decay um, with each of the judges. So with with that in mind, let's look to the text now. We're going to be starting in verse 7 of chapter 3. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They forgot the Lord their God, and they served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He sold them into the hand of Cushan, Reshentheim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people of Israel served Cushan Resentheim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Canaz, Caleb's younger brother. The spirit of the Lord was upon him. He judged Israel. He went out to war and the Lord gave Cushan Resentheim of Mesopotamia into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Resentheim. So the land had rest for 40 years, and then Othniel, the son of Canaz, died. Let's pray. Father, um, we thank you uh, that your word, even as we read it, we're like, what what does this have to do with us today? Um, We're thankful that your word does not go out empty, and we pray that it won't today. Uh, That you will will use it um, in your people today. Um, Oh, would you use it that today we might truly remember the good news of the gospel we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, some of you may have read it or actually seen the movie. There's a, a young adult uh, a book that actually turns into a series uh, called The City of Ember. And it's uh, one of those post-apocalyptic uh, type books. You know, the, the whole world's um, <laughs> blowing up, basically. And, and what happened is they, they create this underground city where they, they take a certain portion of the population, they put them in this underground city. Okay, and, and they're going to be down there for like 200 years. And at the end of 200 years, these people are supposed to come out to a world that's, you know, all the destruction and everything is done with and everything's, uh, nature's back somewhat to normal and they're going to be able to reemerge, right? Well, there's a problem. These people, this, this town in this huge, huge cavern cave, um, they know nothing about their past. All they know is this world of, uh, that they live in in this cave, Okay, in the city, in the cave, and, and the, the mayors of the city were supposed to pass along a box that at the end of 200 years was going to, um, I guess through electronics and stuff, pop open, and then tell them, oh, this is how to get out, this is your past, and, and, and to help the people remember so that they can reemerge and back into the world, and one of the mayors makes a mistake along the way, it gets hidden back in a closet, and nobody knows, and it, it, the thing cracks open, but it's just in the back of a closet, and nobody knows the truth. They're trapped in the city, and the city begins to fall apart, literally, because it's past the end of its life. It's past the 200 years, and all this is happening because these people, they, they can't remember, okay? They, they have no memory of their past, okay? As I, as I think about ourselves, um, as we go into the text, I, I think... You and I often suffer from something very similar. We suffer from something that maybe this morning we call spiritual amnesia. Do do you know what I'm talking about? Maybe that spiritual amnesia hits you every week. Um, You you come in here, you're reminded of the good news of the gospel, right? 
And then we go out into our week, and we find too often that we have spiritual amnesia. We, we forget. What do we see here in our text? Look at verse 7. How does it begin? The people of Israel uh, did, did evil in the sight of the Lord. Why did they do evil in the sight of the Lord? They forgot. They forgot the Lord their God. They forgot him. Why did they do evil? They forgot him. Now, this is a little worse than just typical amnesia, this forgetting. Um, the, the word here, it's, it's actually like an active forgetting. Okay, it's, it's, it's not like just like, uh, oh, you know, I, 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 for a moment I, f- I forgot who God was or, or over a period of time I forgot who he was. It's, this is an active forgetting, an intentional ignoring of God. Okay, it go- so it goes uh, another step uh, beyond that. And, and why in the world would they ever ignore God? Why would they intentionally forget him? And we kind of see it here, don't we? What does it say? Be- and served the Baals, and the Asheroth. Do you see what's going on here? They forget the Lord on the one hand, and they what? They they remember these gods of their neighbors. Okay, They they, they forget, they decide, we're going to forget about our God because we look at these other gods and for whatever reason, they're attractive to the Israelites. There's something about the the way that their neighbors are living that they want a piece of. And they find themselves, okay, well, I'm going to forget my God who rescued me, who who saved me, who who brought me out of slavery, and I'm going to remember the gods of my neighbors. Um, It's very intentional. And this remembering of these, their neighbor's gods, this bowing down to these other gods, it works for them until it doesn't. Do you know what I mean? It works until it doesn't. Have you ever found that in your own life? Maybe as, as you um, choose, maybe even actively forgetting God to choose to, I want to run down this other path. I want to worship this other thing. This other thing is more important to me than it is to God. And we find that for a moment it kind of works for us until it suddenly doesn't. Now, I don't know if how many of you are familiar with, maybe you've seen the movie, but hopefully read the book, The Hobbit. Okay, it's, it's a book of where, where, what is Bilbo doing? Bilbo is going with this, this um, group of dwarves and they're going to get this treasure. This treasure that is guarded and has been accumulated by smog. Okay, smog is a dragon. Okay, not the kind of guy that you want to mess with. And, and he's got it in his cave. He's laying on, you know, the, the, his treasure is like his bed. One day Bilbo, the hobbit, he, he goes in. And as he goes in, he sees the treasure. He sneaks in, and this is what we read, Tolkien writes. To say that Bilbo's breath was taken away is no description at all. There are no words left to express his staggerment. Bilbo had heard tell and and sing and song of the dragon hordes before. But as he looked at it, the, the splendor, the lust, the glory of such treasure had never yet come home to him. He never known the, the glory of this treasure whenever he goes in and he actually sees it with his own eyes. Okay? His heart, Tolkien writes, was filled and pierced with enchantment. And with desire of the dwarves, he gazed motionless, almost forgetting the frightful guardian. You see, he goes in there, he sees this incredible treasure, and, and he, he sees it and he's so attracted by it that he totally forgets the dragon. <laughs> that has to be defeated in order to get to the treasure. Okay, He he looks at it so longingly. He wants it so much that he completely forgets the danger. Like the Israelites forgetting. God's warned them, this is going to happen. You're going to find yourself, and if you don't move these people out, if you don't get rid of them, you're going to find yourself enticed by their gods. And what do we find? We find that exact thing happening this morning in our passage, right? As, as they serve the Baals, as they turn to these other, other gods. This is what we do. John Calvin puts it this way. He says, Man, man's mind is like a store of idolatry and superstition. So much so that if a man believes his own mind, it is certain that he will forsake God and forge some idol in his own brain. Do you do that? 
We, 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 we so easily manufacture idols. The, the, the thoughts just come into our head and we just start creating it and start going after it and, and, and go to worship these things. We find these things so quickly that if we're honest, at times at least, we want more than we want God. We forget the Lord who loves us. That's what the Israelites are doing in this passage, right? They're forgetting their great God who saves and running after these other gods that will never save them. Do you find yourself struggling with spiritual amnesia? You know, it could be that man after the millionth time of confessing and promising to God never again and then running back to pornography yet again thinking somehow it's going to bring satisfaction. Maybe the woman depriving herself of food again because she is content. You know, if, if I could just have that particular body, then life will be okay. Could be the student yet again looking over at a paper right there to their side because they just have to have that grade. Could be the alcoholic going yet again back to the bottle be the mom looking to her child and her child's achievements or behavior and thinking, if my my child can just get these achievements or if my child can just act this way, then, then all will be good. And we understand, do you understand what we're doing when we do these things? So we're exchanging these things for God. We're saying we want these things more than we want God. We are suffering from spiritual amnesia. We're forgetting our great God who saves. Now, there are consequences for this. Look at verse 8. What happens? Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He sold them into the hand of Cushan Reshentheim, king of Mesopotamia, and the people of Israel served Cushan Reshentheim for eight years. You see, what do they do? What, what happens? They, they turn to these other gods, and, and what's the result? God's anger is kindled against them, and what does he do? Do, do, do you understand the weight of the words of, of what it says here, that he sold them? You know the weight of those words for Israelites? Where have they come from? God has, their, their great God has redeemed them, has redeemed them from slavery. And what's happening here is that is being undone, in a sense. It's being undone. He's, in a sense, reversing what he had had previously done. He's he's saying, I rescued you from slavery, and now you're going to go run to these other gods that are no gods? Okay, I'll give you over to it. I'll send you back into slavery. Is that what you want? Now, understand that that what's happening here is, is God's not completely doing away with Israel. That's not what's happening here. Okay? We, we should see this and, and God selling them over that this is an act of discipline in their lives. It's much as we read in Hebrews 12, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves. He chastises every son whom he receives. Why does he do that? He does that so that we might turn from our sin, turn from our idolatry. That's what he's desiring of the Israelites as he sells them into slavery, that they might learn. That they might learn to, to call out on him. And so how does he do it? He sends in this guy with a really difficult name that I've had to say way too many times this morning, Cushan Reshentheim, right? Now, that's not really the guy's name. This name is a pejorative. It's really kind of like a making fun of this guy. Okay? It, it's, basically, it's Cushan the doubly wicked. Okay, that, that's, what, that's what the text says. Mr. Doubly Wicked. And, and the end game for Mr. Doubly Wicked, who thinks he's really wicked, who thinks he's really bad, who thinks he's really super strong, we're going to see what his end is, right? He's no match for God. But, but God sends Mr. Doubly Wicked in. And he comes from a long distance away, and that tells us something. This is a big, powerful guy. He comes from what would probably be kind of like modern-day Iraq area. So it's not like he's just next door. He's a good ways away, which means that he would have to be quite powerful king. 
okay, with a pretty big kingdom in order to pull off what he does. And God allows him to, to hold the people enslaved, we, we read, for eight years. But of course, this isn't the end. And Mr. Doubly Wicked isn't going to win, right? He's going to be put in his place. And it all happens as we move on in our text, verse 9, as the Israelites, as we see the people of Israel cried out. Now, I was reminded as I was thinking about this, I, I don't know, some of you may remember the name Aaron Ralston. Um, he wrote a book called Between a Rock and a Hard Place, uh, probably more popularly known for the movie, 127 Hours. Um, he was out hiking and bouldering and all that kind of stuff one day, and he fell and got trapped. Okay, and he finds himself trapped, and he's trapped for days, trying to think through every single possible way that he can get out from being trapped as a rock has come down and, and on his arm. And finally, after days, this is what he does. This is what he writes. A subtle stirring in my core tells me it's time to pray. I haven't done that yet, but I'm ready now. I close my left hand and a loose fist resting on the chalk stone, shut my eyes and lower my forehead onto my hand. God, I'm praying to you for guidance. I'm trapped here in Blue Canyon. You probably know that. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I've tried everything I can think of. I need some new ideas. Or if I need to try something again, lifting the boulder, amputating my arm, please show me a sign. This guy, he's at his very end. And his first instinct wasn't to pray and to cry out to God. It's like his last instinct. It's the last thing he, he does. And, and I don't lift up Ralston as, I don't know that he's ever become a believer on the other side of this. What we see here is a cry of just incredible desperation, right? It's just a, a cry of, please save you, please, please rescue me. We don't see there any real recognition of who this great God is. He's just crying out to him, right? It's, it's like a last ditch effort, whatever it takes. And we see something very similar here in our text this morning, right? Verse 9, the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. Now, what do those words mean? I think sometimes, and maybe, maybe most all of us in here, as we think through the book of Judges, we, we think of it as a cycle. We talked about the cycle earlier. You know, what do the people do? They, they run off, okay? God sends some sort of oppression on them. And what do we say that they then do? That they repent. And then that God comes in and rescues them. You know what we don't see here in our text this morning? Do you see them repenting? Okay? The word here, it, it's just cry out. That's what they do. Now, there's other places in the Old Testament that the same word cry out is used where there's repentance. But it's always paired with repentance language. Okay? And when it's just somebody crying out, guess what they're doing? They're just crying out. And I think that's what we see here this morning. We just see a people, you know, they, they've been enslaved for years by, by, by Mr. Doubly Wicked, and, and they're upset about it, and, and they just... Their last-ditch effort is to do what? To cry out. Yeah, yeah, you see, and this is what makes this passage so amazing is, is Yahweh, their God, is not reacting to their repentance. He's only reacting to their desperation, even as they're still caught up in their sin. One commentator puts it this way. He says, this is an important conclusion, for it shows that when Yahweh raised up a Savior for Israel, he was not reacting, get this, he was not reacting to any repentance on Israel's part. If anything, he was responding to their misery rather than to their sorrow. To their pain rather than their penitence. Who can ever plumb the abyss of Yahweh's pity for his people, even his sinful people, who are moved more by their distress than by their depravity? Do you understand that? You, you may even understand that at work in your own life, right? Isn't that how often we respond? May, are, are we often far more moved by the consequences than we are by true sorrow for our sin, true repentance? The, the commentator continues, Yahweh is indeed the one who, and we'll read this later in Judges 10, the one who could know who could bear Israel's suffering no longer. 
He could bear it no longer. He couldn't bear to see his people like this anymore. What sheer grace then when Yahweh delivers? This story is a story of incredible grace. Of a God who steps in to deliver his people even as they're remaining stubbornly in their sin. All they're doing is cry out, please help us. We don't like this situation. We don't like being enslaved. Now that's not to say that there weren't any faithful in Israel. There may have been some who were, who were crying out faithfully and repenting, but that's not the text we have before us this morning. We just have a people who are crying out because of the consequences of their sin. And we need to understand that if we live in that place, that place where we're just more concerned with the consequences than we am we're sorry for our own sin, that is a very, very dangerous place to live. Okay? Two weeks ago, I quoted, and I'll probably over and over because it's so fitting in the book of Judges, quoted from John Owen, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That's what happens, and that's what's happening as we go through the book of Judges. That's what's happening to Israel. They aren't killing sin, so sin is killing them. The Israelites, in our passage, they're playing with fire. And so are we. So are we too often when we don't truly turn, when we don't truly repent, when we're, we're just sorrowful for the consequences and not sorrowful for our sin. Do you understand the difference there? It's huge. There's a huge gulf in between those two things. But even, and this is the incredible grace of this passage, even while the people, all they're doing is crying out what happens. Verse 9, back to verse 9. The Lord, what does he do? He raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. And the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Reshentham, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Reshentham. So the land had rest for 40 years, and then Othniel the son of Canaz died. So here, and I know you're probably worried because now we're just now getting to the judge, right? Um, but we're, we're, we're closing in on the end, so no worries. Um, but here we have the first judge of the book of Judges come in. Now, Peter said this last week, but I want to make sure that we understand when we talk about a judge here in the book of Judges, it's kind of a misnomer for you and I because we think of like a guy in a black robe sitting in the front of a courtroom. That's not what these judges are. I love my, my former professor, Bruce Walke, he, he, he like entitles the book of Judges. You know what he calls it? He puts a title on it. And he calls it the gift of the warlords. That's what God is doing. He's giving Israel, it's a gift to them. He's giving them different warlords. That's what these judges are. They're warlords. They're, they're warriors that go to battle to, as we see in our text, to deliver his people. That's who these judges are, okay? So don't get confused we, we should probably just completely retitle the book of Judges or something. I, I don't know, because it, it becomes confusing for us. And so that's who Othniel is. He's, he's a warrior. And actually, you could see him, if you, if you flip back, we're not going to do it now, but in Judges chapter 1, we actually see Othniel. And Othniel, he wins a battle. He, he overtakes this one little city. And as a result, there's kind of a romantic story. He wins a girl as a result of, uh, of, of defeating the city. Now, What's before Othniel now is something much bigger. Okay, this, this isn't the, like the little city that he had conquered back in Judges chapter 1. This is Mr. Doubly Wicked. Okay, this big king of Mesopotamia. Okay, so how is Othniel ever going to defeat this guy? How can, how can this take place? And we, we read it there in our passage, uh, don't we? Verse 10, the spirit of the Lord was upon him. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him. That's how Othniel is able to defeat. Now, let's be careful. Let's make sure we understand what this means that the Spirit of the Lord is upon him. Because when we think of it, we think of it kind of in like Acts 2 language often, okay? And the, the way the Spirit's poured out on the New Testament church. That's not what's going on here, okay? This pouring out of the Spirit upon Othniel says nothing about who Othniel is. Okay? It doesn't say anything about Othniel, who Othniel is. Othniel may have been a great guy. He may have been a very devout follower of Yahweh. Our text doesn't tell us whether that's the case or not. It tells us, though, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And before we think that that means a whole lot about Othniel, 
Do, do you remember a guy named Balaam? Okay? Balaam was a, a pagan prophet. Do you know what happens to that pagan prophet? He, he doesn't come to believe in Yahweh. But you know what happens to him in Numbers verse chapter 24? And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Same exact language. Okay? So let's not read into, in other words, the Spirit of the Lord coming down, it's, it's not about Othniel. Okay? But it says everything about Yahweh. It says everything about Israel's great God. That he, it's not even Othniel, that it is the great God who saves. That's who it should be pointing to. Back to Aaron Ralston. He was caught between a rock and a hard place, literally. It's the title of the book. And many of you know what the result of that was is he ends up amputating his arm in order to get out. Now, the interesting thing is, particularly if you read his book, you see it, that he recognizes that he didn't save himself. Okay? That was certainly part of what needed to happen in order for him to get to rescue. But without others almost immediately becoming a part of the rescue, he would have been dead. Okay? If, if there hadn't been other hikers that, that found him almost immediately when he got back on the trail, he would have been a goner. He may have done a valiant thing and whatever he did, but he didn't rescue himself. He, he needed rescue outside of himself. Okay? The Israelites in our passage this morning, they need a rescue outside of themselves. Even outside of Othniel, as great as he is, don't miss, and as we move through the whole book of Judges, let's not miss who the real warrior is. Okay? Well, let's not miss who, who the real judge is, the one who really wins these battles. It is God who rescues them. Right? Oth- Othniel would have never succeeded. He would have never had any hope except for God. There would have been no hope without him. You know what's so interesting to me? You know, we, we've entitled this series uh, A Kingless Kingdom, right? And what's so interesting, that that's the, the people's take on it, right? That, that they're living in this place and they're living as though they have no king. All right? They're living as though they have no king. But what did we just read about? That the great king comes in. They're living as though they have no king. They're they're not bowing their knee to the great king, and yet the great king comes in to rescue them. They're living as though they have no king, and yet they do. And he comes in, and and he he rescues them, and he uses Othniel as a means of doing that. Othniel, who is, as we would call, a type of Christ. Okay, Somebody who we see in him a, a little bit of pointing to Jesus, the ultimate deliverer right? The ultimate one who's going to save. But Othniel has failings, right? And we just said pretty much everything in our passage is positive about Othniel, right? But you get to that very, very end. And what do we read? So the land had rest for 40 years. 40 years. That's good. That's really good. But it's not great. Okay? Okay. That, that 40 years of rest for the Israelites, that's a good thing, right? But it's not the great thing. It's not the best thing. It's not what they needed most. And that's how Othniel, he, he points to the greater deliverer, the greater warrior that is to come ultimately. The reason why we're gathered here this morning, because of King Jesus. Because the great king who has come down and don't miss the incredible battle that he fought. You know, sometimes I, I think we, we think of Jesus as so meek and mild and don't realize the battle that he was fighting as he was on the cross. And quite frankly, as he stepped through every single day of his life, he went to war, he went to battle for you and I, and not just to win 40 years of rest, but to win eternal rest. That's such good news. And as I was thinking of that, I, I couldn't help but think of, uh, for some reason, and it fits well with Judges, I was thinking of Ephesians 2. And I want to read part of it to you this morning and just see how it resonates with maybe some of the things that we're talking about of, of where people are in Judges. And, and you were dead in your trespasses 
and sins in which you once walked. Isn't that the Israelite? Isn't that, that, that where we find them this morning as, 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 as we find them forgetting the Lord their God? Dead in their trespasses and sin which you once walked. Following the courses of this world. Following the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that is at work and the sons of disobedience. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. What were they doing? What were we doing? Forgetting our God. Worshiping other gods. And while we were yet doing that, what do we read? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we're dead in our trespasses, even when we're rolling around, if you will, in our sins, what does he do? He makes us alive, made us alive, together with Christ. By grace, grace you have been saved. By grace, you've been saved. I mentioned it before. Please don't miss it. The story that we just read in Judges, it's an incredible picture of grace. An undeserving people who God comes in and rescues even when they don't deserve it. Even when they're, they're not repentant. He comes in and he rescues them and he delivers them. By grace, you have been saved. And he raised us up with him, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved, through faith. It's not your own doing. It's a gift from God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we, who are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Do you know that good news this morning? Do you know this morning that incredible story, an incredible true story of our Redeemer, of the great King who came? You see, our passage tells us about the Israelites who forgot. They forgot the story. They forgot the story of their redemption, of how, how their great God Yahweh had, had come in and rescued them from slavery. And they turned to these other gods. What about you? Do, do you know the story? That while we were yet dead in our sins, He came and He did battle for us. Now, here's the problem, of course. As we move into our week, we'll find ourselves forgetting, won't we? And it's so sad that we do. At times, you may be forgetting just because Scripture is not enough on your mind. You don't think enough of the gospel, that it's not enough of a part of your, your daily rhythms and your life, that, that you literally just don't even think about it, okay? You may be more like the Israelites, even in our passage, where you actively choose to forget because you look at him, and then you look at this other thing, and you say, right now, I think I want this thing more than I want him. We'll find ourselves forgetting this week, won't we? And so we need to think through how, how do we remember? How can we remember so that we don't forget? How do we do it? I, I remember many, probably 20-something years ago now, and I don't even know where this sermon is or which one it is, a sermon by Tim Keller, I just remember this phrase, and it's probably not even the phrase he used, but somehow I've remembered it. But he said this, he said, remember the story by tasting the word. Remember the story by tasting the word, not tasking the word, sorry. Um, remember the story by tasting the word. We're, we're so prone to forget you know, as the psalm says, so, so prone to leave the God that we love, right? So prone to do that. How, how, how can we stop forgetting so much? We can stop forgetting, or it's a help, there's no magic pill to it, but, but God has given us his word. And by tasting of his word and tasting of it regularly and often and, and knowing it 
Not, not just when we, we sit down for a moment to read it, but actually knowing it, knowing it throughout our day and even rehearsing scriptures back to ourselves. By constantly tasting the word, we're reminded of our great king. We're reminded of that incredible story, that incredibly true story of the one who has come to redeem us. We're reminded of our great redeemer who saves. So, do you know that story this morning? Do you this morning know the story, the true story of Jesus Christ, the one who rescued you, who went to battle for you? Do you know that story? And are you going to, as we go into our week, are you going to remind yourself of that story over and over, reminding yourself of the one who has rescued you? Or are you going to forget, like the Israelites? We must go back again and again. We must remember the story by tasting the word. Do not, as you go into this week, and I, I, I need to hear this too, we must not forget our deliverer. We must not forget the one who went to battle for us conquering sin and death so that we would never have to. Do you believe it? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we need you. I often say that as I get done preaching because we do. We need you at work this day, this afternoon, on Monday and Tuesday and throughout the rest of the week. Oh, Father, we, we know how prone we are to forget. We find ourselves doing it regularly, forgetting the wonder of the one who has saved and redeemed us. Father, might it not be so this week? Might it be less so this week? Would you help this day to truly help us to remember the story as we taste and feast on the word this week. Remind us of our great Savior, Jesus Christ. The one who has come, who has saved us, who has redeemed us. Help us to go forth today as thankful people. People who are so thankful, so enamored, so in love with you that we wouldn't enticed by the supposed jewels that lay around us, those supposed treasures of the world, but that our eyes would be focused on you. Would you be doing a work on our hearts even now? Oh, help us as we go into this week to remember the incredible story of our redemption. Might it be at work, transforming us more and more, we pray. We pray this all in the matchless name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.